I'm Livy, I'm 14 years old, and I'm a five-time survivor of acute myeloid leukemia. And I'm Roberta, I'm Olivia's mom. Mm, I think more than anything, it was probably shock and disbelief initially. For me, I was kind of overwhelmed because I didn't know what was ahead, um, as well as I was nervous because I didn't know what was going to happen and what the outcome would be. So um, I just kind of got the mindset that I'll try my hardest and what happens, happens. So. My parents noticed that I had been coughing a lot and it was a non-stop cough um, in addition to a low-grade fever which um, would not subside. So they, we went to the pediatrician's office and uh, at first they said I had strep throat. So they sent me home with some cough medicine. We went back into the pediatrician's office um, and they did some blood samples. Threw some blood tests and determined that I um, had acute myeloid leukemia, which um, in my case, uh, first time uh, affected my white blood cells. Your normal white count should be somewhere around four to twelve thousand. Four to twelve thousand, and mine was around. At that time, when we got in there, it was a hundred and eighty some thousand, and it was still climbing. So, so it was at a hundred and ninety something at that point. Um, and since I was so little, they had to not do the apheresing in the arms um, because my veins were too small. They had to go in through my legs, so my inner thighs basically, and they cycled out all the bad blood um, and gave me new basically, or just cleansed it and then put it back in. And then um, they started me off on chemo almost right, right they, away. After the apheresing, her white count was still about 56,000, which is still astronomical, but at least it's more manageable. They determined from that um, that um, moving forward then what they were going to do, the protocol that they would start with and um, the treatment that she would have initially, which was intense chemo um, and lots of spinal taps, lots of bone marrow aspirates. Um, we were in for the long haul, but really didn't know it at that time. Just one day at a time is kind of how we approached it. And it was September of 2004, and she was to have her last treatment actually that day, and they had done a spinal tap and marrow aspirate, and they came back and had told us that the cancer was back. Dr. Roddy uh, wasn't exactly sure how to handle that, not knowing if he should just uh, treat systemically or if just interthecal or do both, which the interthecal is around the brain and spine as far as the treatment. So he concurred with uh, the top dog on AML leukemia, which is a gentleman down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And they determined that they would just do the interthecal chemo. So what she had to have done then was numerous spinal taps and then she was given treatment at the same time which that's pretty scary because that's chemo around your brain. Um, and you don't know what that can do. You know, maybe not now, but later down the road, the late effects from that can be, you know, pretty intense. Six different treatments that she had um, over a period of time. And then we were good to go. We got to leave and come home and and she was cancer free Until July then of 2005, which I'll let you continue. Um, then we went in for a routine checkup and they did a uh, normal checkup. Bring in, they check your weight, height and everything, uh, blood pressure, then uh, usually we get sent off to the culture lab. Back at this time, I was still doing the bone marrow aspirates so they did uh, the blood tests and then they did the bone marrow aspirate um, and they determined that it was back again shortly after they got the results back from the bone marrow aspirate. When I had first came or come in, um, they had tissue typed both of my parents in case of a transplant and at this point they said that I would need to go ahead and have a transplant. They determined it would need to be bone marrow. So. 
Um, they tissue type both of my parents, and my dad came out to be a 6 6 match, right. which was perfect for uh, the transplant. Um, they hooked up everything and they went through with my transplant. Um, everything went really well um, with the transplant. Uh, I, my Every well, like my body and everything took well to it. Um, there weren't really any rejections um, or any sites of rejections, which at uh, some points I guess was kind of nerve wracking because you need um, a little bit of graft versus host, which is basically just the new cells um, with the old cells, like a conflict between them um, and being accepted and. Um, I never really got any of that, which was good because that means that it was accepted, but it also could have been bad because it means that they could have been declined and the transplant wouldn't have worked. But um, thankfully it worked um, and I was in remission for three years. So that was August 18th of 2005 when she had her bone marrow transplant. Um, and I went in through first grade, second, third, and fourth. Um, and I would have been three years. Um, so we went in for another annual checkup. Uh, they did blood and they, um, you know, everything was checking out to be fine. Um, when one day uh, I was in school um, and we were, um, well, I was in, well, we were in school and um, we were just kind of, you know, sitting there when all of a sudden I got a pain. In my we thumb. went into the ER um, and they couldn't, well, they did They did an x-ray. An x-ray to find out to see if yep. any bones were broken and an MRI, which they didn't find anything on the x-ray um, until they did the MRI. But before they were setting me up for the MRI, we were sitting in like the, the waiting room basically, but it, it was just kind of like the the, what, whatever they call those, holding rooms, I guess right. they're not yeah. really on. Yep. So they did the MRI and they determined that it was an abscess. So they said, let's get you in, um, we'll remove this abscess and it'll all be over with, you can go home and everything will be okay. Right. Um, so when we were getting me prepped to go into surgery to get the abscess removed, one of my nurses was going out of the unit while one of my um, doctors from the past was walking in. I knew immediately that it was not an abscess. So she ran straight to the computer, looked up the MRI scans, and she called off the surgery and everything. Um, so because your your numbers, you had no neutrophils. Because my neutrophils were nothing. Zero. So we had, ran a really high risk of infection, and she didn't want me to go into surgery and, you know, have myself get sick so uh, she basically just called everything off and she said that I need to have a biopsy done before um, we can go ahead with any of this. When they biopsied um, the blood they determined that it was cancerous so they... Same kind AML it was just same kind. Um, concentrated in that one area so what they did was they said she would have uh, direct radiation to that arm right. and chemotherapy. So right. they started me off on chemo and then shortly after they started chemo they did radiation um, and you know everything subsided and you had we 36 went. rounds of um, direct radiation but it was like a short each time that she had it. Very very intense but quick. And that was uh, that was during March and April of, of 2008. 2009. Eight. No, eight. nine. Yeah, nine. Eight. So yep. we were grade year up until October of that year. We were doing an art project when we were in school. And, um, you know, our, our art teacher was kind of crazy, and she just asked us to examine every inch of your face. She said, pull down your eyelids, look in your ears, you know, look up your nose, whatever you need to do to find inspiration to make a good self-portrait. So um, I went and I pulled down my eyelid, and I noticed what looked like a red blister on the inner corner of my eye. It wasn't blocking my eyesight or anything. I could still see, but uh, I, I didn't think of it as normal. So I went to the nurse's office. They called my mom right away. Um, and we went into the ER that same Removed night. the little blister. Um, 
And once they removed it, they tested it, and it came back again positive. Um, they decided that I would need to just do chemo this time, and they said that I would need to have another transplant. Um, tested my father to see if he would be a match, and of course he was. He was a 11-11 match, which right. was perfect for the stem cells. Um, so. I couldn't really walk um, a long distance without getting shortness of breath, um, or I couldn't walk up the stairs without, you know, having to sit down <clears throat> after I had walked up the stairs. And so um, they went in, and when they were listening to my heart, um, my PA took a kind of a closer listen, and he heard what he described as a crackle in the base of my lungs. He decided that we would want to go in to get an x-ray to make sure that there were no broken bones. Um, and then um, we, he said that if nothing shows up on the x-ray, try an MRI. So they did the x-ray and they noticed something on the x-ray that, that was enlarged. my heart was enlarged. Yeah. So they ended up actually not doing the MRI at all. And they took me straight to get an yeah, echocardiogram. Mm -hmm. yep. So my heart was enlarged because my pericardium um, was full of fluid, which normally you shouldn't have much in there. It's just to help with um, the fluidness of your heart. What mine was doing, it was not working like that it, because there was so much fluid built up. It was basically constricting my heart and not letting it or allowing it to beat. So uh, they uh, inserted a drain just below my what is that? Sternum. Sternum. Mm -hmm. um, in the bathroom, and I sat down. And when I stood up, um, a little piece of tissue, um, which normally happens, uh, little pieces of uh, tissue deposit come out, and they would end up in the fluid. And this one piece of tissue had balled itself up inside of the tube. And when I stood up, it let loose, and all of this fluid poured into the drain. And so I pulled one of my nurses in, and they. Um, decided that the drain wasn't going to be efficient enough and that we needed to place what is called a pericardial window, which they hadn't done um, on many pediatric patients before. Um, so I was one of the first kids who had gotten a pericardial window. Um, and so we've had no complications since then. Right. Um, and uh, so... Four and a half years now in remission. Yeah. <clears throat> But always having somebody there or knowing that somebody could come and um, be with you during, you know, kind of slow time or boring time just to do something. Um, I mean, and it doesn't even have to be something big. It could have been pull out a deck of cards and you could, I mean, do anything. But just something other than watching TV or looking at a wall for change. That would definitely be mine. Um, well, I think for me, it's probably getting to meet other families and knowing that you're not alone and um, you share a lot of the same experiences, even though every child's cancer journey is different. Uh, there's still a lot of similarities and you can kind of feed off of each other and learn things from each other. Well, um, for me, it's given me a lot of new experiences. Um, meeting people, uh, well, specifically kids that are going through the same thing. Um, and, you know, having them share their story with me and learning about them and how, you know, some things that they've gone through are some of the same things that I've gone through. And uh, I think for me as the parent that it's kind of, it's brought us closer together having a better, a better understanding of, you know, you saw your child go through all of that and um, it definitely makes you appreciate what you have and uh, maybe not complain about as much uh, the things that really don't matter. For me, um, it is definitely definitely changed my life for the better um, I get to see a lot of people that I love seeing every year every time I come back um, 
And there's a lot of opportunities that you wouldn't be able to have in you know everyday life. Every time you come back, it's you basically start back up where you left off, and it's it's also really nice to have people there yet again to um, know what you're going through or know what you've been through. Um, Such an important role that camp plays um, in their lives because they've been thrown into a, a different situation than most kids and uh, it's very meaningful and uh, also the beads those are great when you're going through treatment the beads of bravery um, you can use it as a tool to perhaps bribe your child if you need to um, but it's just something neat and positive along with so many other things that they do and I don't know where we'd be without it.